Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for your time to, to join us in this in this webinar. We're really happy to have so many of you online. Our, our numbers have been really great for today's webinar and for the other ones uh, in this series. Um, this is the second of three Economic Development Essentials webinars that the Economic Development Division of the Ministry of Jobs, Tourism, and Skills Training is hosting over um, a month or so in September and October. Um, if you missed the first of the series, which was focused on investment readiness, it, it, it was recorded and it's now archived on the Rural BC site. Um, and just for, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Rural BC site, um, it's www.ruralbc.gov.bc.ca. And if you go to the webinar section of that website, you'll find um, archived uh, webinars and also registration for future uh, upcoming webinars. And the next one in the Economic Development Essential Series is on strategic planning for economic development, um, and that's on October 10th. Um, so first, I just want to provide a little bit of context for where the webinar series originated. Um, about a year ago, um, here in the Economic Development Division, we were hearing directly from communities that training on economic development concepts would be beneficial for local leaders. Um, we heard that some focused information about the role of local leaders and economic development processes and activities uh, would be beneficial for communities. Um, and, uh, you know, a community across the province of all, of all different sizes. So in response to that need, uh, in the early part of 2013, we held 15 economic development essentials workshops for local leaders. Uh, we had about 400 attendees at those workshops um, and really positive response. Uh, based on the feedback that we received at the workshops um, and also from, from folks who weren't, weren't able to attend one of the workshops, we're following up on them uh, with these webinars, um, and the three topics that were chosen were the topics that were indicated to be of greatest interest um, to, to those that we did hear from. So just a quick rundown on the structure of today's workshop. So in a couple of seconds, I'm going to turn it over to Kathy Code, and she'll start us off um, uh, with a brief overview of business retention and expansion uh, information and some new resources that we've just launched to support your work in this area. And then we've got three um, – uh, oh, sorry, Darby, I think we're on the next uh, – Sorry, yes, please, keep um, and then And then we'll uh, have three case studies. We'll start with Terry McDonald, and she'll provide us with a – with an overview of a Kootenai business retention and expansion pilot. Uh, Peter McGee will talk about um, his experience leading a BRNE process in Nanaimo. And then Colin will talk about the Kamloops experience, a Venture Kamloops uh, Advisors Program. Following the three case studies, we'll, we've got some time for a discussion and information sharing, which I hope you all um, participate in and, and uh, open up your, your phone line to or, or uh, submit some questions online so that we can you know, share some information and, and answer any questions that you might have. So I mentioned that we just launched some, um, some new business retention and expansion information, and Kathy will be walking us through the, the details. And that information is on our, our relatively new business attraction toolkit for BC communities. And the website for the toolkit is on the slide that's, that's in front of you there. Um, so this is an online resource that was launched last spring, and it focuses on the stages of investment attraction. So, and it's a community resource. Um, so, for uh, for for uh, to support your economic development work, and whether you're a community who's just starting out along the the journey of uh, of attracting investment or business to your community, or maybe you're looking for guidance on how to host a potential investor that's that's coming to your community, or maybe you're looking to do what we're talking about here today and and support the communities that are currently in your in. A, Sorry, to support the businesses that are currently in your community to uh, to stay where they are and to expand. There are tools, resources, and, and support to exist wherever you, you land um, across that spectrum. So Kathy's going to talk about the section of the toolkit, and I'm not sure if you can see it on the slide there. It's kind of the top left part of the, uh, the circle there. It's titled, Support Businesses Within Your Community. So we've heard from lots of community representatives, such as yourselves and local leaders, that this is a key area of focus and more support is needed. 
So we've enhanced this section. We, we've built it out, added more information, added some, some tools to support your BRNE activities. Um, and so with that, to, to walk through the details, I'll pass it over to Kathy. Kathy Code is a Policy and Program Analyst in the Economic Development Division, and she led the development of these BRNE resources. So over to you, Kathy. Oh, thank you, Amy, for that. Um, and I'm pleased to know that so many of you are already familiar with the BRNE process, so that makes my job a lot easier. Uh, but just to, to begin at the beginning, then, um, the BRNE is an approach that's focused on encouraging existing businesses to stay in and grow within your community. Research, research has shown that in an urban and suburban setting that local businesses are responsible for 80% of the jobs and investments. And, of course, this reliance increases greatly in rural settings. Um, BRNE promotes business success and vitality through developing those relationships with local business uh, operators. So it's a, basically a business, uh, an approach that helps facilitate a dialogue then um, between uh, local economic development representatives and businesses. Um, through this process, you can find out how businesses are faring in the local economy and come up with strategies and tools then that will help businesses operate more efficiently. Um, some of the things that can come out of a VR and E are um, uh, assisting with regional promotion of your community. I mean, what, what's your business known for? Why do people want to come to your community? Um, it can help your community retain and recruit workers, uh, help companies uh, export and expand awareness of local products, and, and most of all, lead up to that business networking and collaboration that will develop supplier chains and enhance consumer markets. Um, so I'm going to give you the whirlwind tour, tour then of the, the online resource that we've developed for you. Um, although there are many uh, approaches to BRNE, I've featured actually two specific ones, uh, either one of them that can be developed and modified according to your specific needs. Um, I've focused uh, the first one on the structured BRNE process whereby you develop a, a formal committee um, that's complemented by a, a fleet of volunteers. You do a survey, the data collection and analysis, out of which come the recommendations that form the action plan, and again, uh, is, is umbrellaed by that ongoing relationship building. And then the second approach that, I've, uh, that I'll take you through is the business walks approach. It's a blitz style approach, which is a, a fast, immediate um, um, blitz throughout the community, business community, that is, uh, that develops an action plan, and again, depends highly on an ongoing relationship building process. So for community leaders, it's an opportunity to show how valued the local businesses are and to develop an environment in which businesses can thrive and prosper. And for business owners, it's an opportunity for, for a forum to voice their concerns and ideas for remedies and a chance to be part of the process and the solution. So, I've, for, for the purposes of this presentation, I've developed, I've um, divided the structured BRNE uh, process into three phases. So if we could go to the website then, Darby. Okay. Um, yeah. So I'll have to hurry here. So uh, the, so I. <laughs> okay. So basically, the the three phases are the community readiness and preparation. Second phase is business survey, data collection, and analysis, uh, recommend, uh, leading up to the recommendations, and then the third phase are the recommendations, action plan, and ongoing follow-up. So this structured process can take up to two years. So the key is to know that you have lots of patients, a really good, strong, and dedicated project committee, and a really good volunteer base. Um, and of course, developing those relationships will help alert you to issues sooner and, and so that you can address them more quickly. In terms of community readiness, you have to know where your community is in terms of developing this process, what the local uh, economics are, uh, what the leadership is, what your cur current resources are, what your budget and volunteers look like, and what are the, some of the challenges that you're facing. Is it a decline in economic activity in the downtown core? Um, are you competing with the big box stores? Is there a scaled labor shortage? Um, the next one is the BRNE process then, which is the actual uh, process where you set up the committee, uh, you recruit your volunteers, 
um, again, with a great diversity um, and, and ensuring a dedication of, of all the people involved, um, learning what your budget is, setting up your goals, your communication strategy, and designing the process and conducting it. And then next slide would be the recommendations and action plan, where you're, you're actually taking those actions and, and implementing them to, to develop those solutions then that will help uh, your businesses thrive and prosper. So that's a really important part. Um, and the results that can come out of this are, are encouragement of niche markets, of developing the local supplier chains, and holding local events to build ties between local businesses and consumers. And also, um, for further edification, we've developed uh, resources for you. Um, We've got information concerning case studies and, uh, and an entire list of resources and links and, um, that will help you through the process. The next one is the business walks, which I talked about earlier, which is the blitz approach. And this is an approach pioneered by the Central Okanagan Economic Development Commission, and I'd really like to thank uh, Carrie Griffiths of that organization for agreeing uh, to share the materials that, that they've developed. Um, what they've done then is throughout a three-hour period, they've had mayors and economic development leaders um, blitz through the community asking three questions. What's working for them, what's not working, and what the recommendations are, and from there an action plan is developed. So in the website then, we've got a toolkit for you that talks about uh, what is a business walk, it goes through the process, and then has a uh, a list of the resource materials, and uh, again, thanks to Corey Griffiths from uh, COEDC. Um, so everyone is welcome to use these materials and to adapt the survey templates and the process to whatever needs uh, their communities come up with. So um, if you have any questions, please let me know. Okay, great. And there's Kathy's uh, contact information there. <clears throat> Thank you, Kathy. Does anyone, should we go to questions at this point, Kirby? I don't see any questions on there, and, and I, we're running just a little bit behind, so should we, uh, should we go on to the next? Sure. Yeah. Uh, so next, we're, we'll turn it over to Terry McDonald. Um, Dr. Terry McDonald holds a PhD in Educational Studies from UBC and serves as the BC Regional Innovation Chair in Rural Economic Development at Selkirk College. Terry also heads up a team of researchers at the Columbia Basin Rural Development Institute, a Selkirk College Columbia Basin Trust partnership focused on supporting informed decision making in the basin boundary region. So with that, I'll turn it over to Terry to walk us through her case study. Thank you. Can everyone, can you hear me okay? Fine, Terry. Go ahead. Thanks. Okay, perfect. Um, thank you, Darby and Amy and Kathy, for inviting me to join the webinar webinar today to share our experiences here in the in the Kootenai region. Let me see if I can get these slides moving in the right direction. Here we are. Um, as mentioned, uh, I serve as the BC Re Regional Innovation Chair in Rural Economic Development, but I also head up uh, a unique partnership here at the college uh, focused on supporting informed decision making. And if it wasn't for uh, the resources at the institute. Uh, much of the work that we've we've done over the last year and a bit um, probably wouldn't have happened. So it's a, it's a great partnership between the Columbia Basin Trust and Selkirk College. A little bit about our institute: we're the only college-based rural-placed uh, rural development institute in the country. Uh, other RDIs or CDIs are located at universities, so we're uniquely positioned in in rural communities. We cover a pretty large catchment area. It's the Columbia Basin Trust area in addition to the boundary. So we go from the Alberta border to Big White all the way up to Valmont. So it's a, it's a pretty big uh, catchment area with 28 municipalities. And our work really focuses beyond the economic. We're understanding rural revitalization uh, sort of in a more holistic way with respect to economic, social, environmental, and cultural aspects. And we take a truly regional approach. So we look for things that matter across the communities, and, and we try to pull the, together a regional collaboration to address. And that's really exactly what we've done here with the business retention and expansion. Uh, a little bit about our project. Uh, when I started my position two and a half years ago, uh, some of our communities had moved forward with uh, BRE efforts, and a number were stepping up to the plate, very interested to move forward. And from a research perspective, um, I certainly noted that 
the different communities were using different surveys. And to get a better understanding of what's happening in our corridors and or in our region as a whole, um, I knew that instinctively that it, we really should be using the, the same survey. It also became very clear that communities needed resources, as we're talking about here. They wanted to do a brief but didn't really know what was involved, what types of resources they needed, and, and they needed tools to help. So that's where the, the RDI stepped in. So we did a little bit of research. We formed a regional advisory group, and we looked at creating an approach, which is still evolving. We're in the, the second year of a three-year pilot, where you can see on point two here this idea of capacity, capacity inclusive. A number of our communities do not have uh, EDOs in place. Um, many don't have anybody paid to do economic development, so uh, we knew that a collaborative approach was really, really necessary for our communities, and we needed to recognize that many of these communities really lacked uh, what I call economic development capacity, but we wanted them included still. So we uh, moved forward with some process support. Um, the Institute does all the research uh, support, so we do all the data analysis and reporting, report back out to communities. So that's a key piece, making it uh, much more affordable for communities to move forward with a with a BRI. And we've tied to the BC Business Counts um, program from EDABC, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with about. And then we're looking now, uh, we have about 500, I think, surveys to date in the database that we hold for the region. And we're looking at not only community, but corridor and regional level analysis. Uh, the example of the regional analysis was the recently completed manufacturing and technology sector development uh, project. So we were able to do a report, and I believe that report is on the provincial BC site. Okay, so as I mentioned, we did some background work and we formed an advisory group, and we developed and are refining a number of tools, and this is ever evolving as we're really figuring it out as we go. We've uh, put together some training materials and training workshops, one day long workshops for uh, folks that are going to be undertaking a BRI. We have uh, a manual, which I believe is posted in the handouts uh, section up on the top there. I think Darby showed you where that is. And um, uh, we developed an analytic and reporting framework. Um, some other products, uh, one of the recent products that we've developed is something called a lead sheet. So we're noticing that our communities aren't necessarily following up on action items uh, real time as they're collecting their data. So when the project is finished, we give them a lead sheet to remind them, hey, here are some uh, businesses. If you haven't contacted them yet, you should, with things we call low-hanging fruit. And that can be red flags, uh, businesses that are rating, their, um, rating themselves as poor, or uh, talking about exiting, they don't have a successor, or green flags that they want to expand but they're having problems finding an adequate site location. So we provide that support and the Columbia Basin Trust also steps up uh, to provide support for communities to offset costs of hiring a, a coordinator or a researcher. So again, that's a good partnership. So what we've decided to do collaboratively as an advisory group is really to focus um, more on the research and relationship building side of things as opposed to the business walk side of things. So we have structured survey-driven interviews uh, that are undertaken by, it varies between one and three people. Uh, we'll take on that researcher, researcher role. And it's data focused, but it's not compromising of building of relationships. So we're really taking a strong research angle here. And the rationale is that we want the information that we need to support planning at a regional or a corridor level. And with good research, we can feel comfortable about the findings and um, allows us that level of, of confidence that, uh, that these findings can actually be used. Um, we have a rigorous uh, research protocol and analysis, and that's something that we take very seriously and is a big part of the training, the one-day workshop. And then, again, we've got that regional collaborative model where we're, it's community-based, but we're really supporting one another. So uh, partners are picking up the phone, um, talking to each other about what they're learning and how did they go about doing this. So it's a really good collaborative approach. And it's, uh, the model is really ongoing and uh, evolving. So to date, as I mentioned, this is actually so much has happened over the last couple of weeks. We're over 500 surveys now. Um, we have finished a, a project in the Boundary, Lower Columbia, which is the, the Trail Rosland uh, sort of mini corridor. We've done the regional uh, manufacturing and technology uh, project with the Innovation Councils here. Uh, the Cusp has just concluded, and Golden is actually 
uh, 40 plus surveys into data collection right now, as is the Slocan Valley. So we have a couple of other communities stepping up uh, now. Kimberly has started their efforts, Sparwood soon. Um, and we're talking with other communities in our region about uh, their interest in Bree, uh, looking forward to our final year, the 2014. And hopefully we'll have all communities completed, but uh, that's ambitious, but we'll see. Uh, the, the other part of the strategy is that this would be a sort of um, on a rotation and focusing on what we've learned through best practices that it, it doesn't stop. It's an ongoing thing. Communities should be revisiting this process every three years and should be focused on the follow-up. So we talk a lot about community readiness, and I know there's a little bit about this on the, on the, um, the provincial site, so I'm not going to repeat it, but it's really do you have the human and the financial resources to support this type of undertaking. We spend a lot of time before uh, implementation of a BRI in a community talking a lot about pre-planning. It's critical that you know um, what your goals and your objectives are. So we talk about what is your purpose, are you looking general business climate? Are you looking uh, to better understand certain sectors? What's the geographic scope? We have some communities that are, that are moving forward uh, with multiple communities in a corridor or if it's a community by itself. And identify the businesses in your community and the scope of the project. So a number of our communities don't actually have business licensing in place. So it makes it a little bit more tricky for them to find a sample that's that's going to be right for them and to identify those businesses. But they are um, they are managing to tackle this challenge. And then looking at whether or not you want a ran random sample or a targeted approach. And again, in the manual uh, that, that I've posted, there's some information about how you go about sampling um, to meet your needs and your objectives. So what we've learned so far is that businesses do want to talk. Um, there was some thought when we first started that businesses have been surveyed to death. Uh, they are feeling that, yes, this is actually going to result in something because communities that have moved forward have done so in partnership with their local government, their Chamber of Commerce, and their Community Futures, and any other economic development um, folks within the, within the community. And that sort of shows that, hey, we're, we are committed as a community to work together to address the needs that are coming up to these surveys. It's been more about green flags than red, which was a, a, pleasant, a pleasant surprise meaning that there's opportunities businesses do want to expand. They're just having some challenges with, with certain areas. You can expect about four hours per business if you want to undertake one of these projects, and that's from um, calling, making the appointment, doing the interview, entering the data. We have found that the findings are now being linked to economic development plans and concrete action, and that context does matter, so process the process does need to be customized to meet the unique needs of each community, but it still can be done with this, within this regional model. Um, okay, so critical ingredients to success. So as I mentioned, you need strong and committed leadership. It sends a really big message. The partnerships are key. You need to make sure that you have the resources in place and you do that pre-planning. Uh, before you start going out and talking to businesses, you need to make sure that you have resources for follow-up, which is critical. You need champions. It's good to start with some short-term success, and you need to commit over, over the long term um, to things like business appreciation events and follow-up. The other thing that we've learned here in the Kootenays is so far we've done really, really I, I think, a pretty good job connecting the findings to economic development planning. The thing that we are struggling with here is really making sure that we're doing that follow-up with the individual businesses, particularly in the communities that don't have those uh, dedicated, dedicated economic development um, folks. So now I'm going to turn it to Darby. I have a short video, and that concludes my presentation this afternoon. Thank you. 
their project department. Actually, what else is it? What is the cost to 179 companies in the manufacturing and technology world? So we do work the hour and a half conversation survey to find out what the Peter McGee is the Economic Development Coordinator with the Nanaimo Economic Development Corporation. His professional background is in communications and marketing, which has lent itself well to the promotion and execution of a successful BRNE program. In his current role, one of Peter's primary responsibilities has been as program administrator of the BRNE program, Nanaimo Business Counts, and that's what he'll be talking to us about today. So I'll pass it over to Peter. Great. Thank you so much, and thank you very much for having me on this uh, this webinar. It's a, an exciting process, and I'm excited to be uh, included. So, yes, I'm Peter McGee, and here we go. So, just a little bit about the uh, the NADC, the Nanaimo Economic Development Corporation. Uh, we were formerly a department within the city of Nanaimo, and separated about two years ago to form uh, an arms length corporation, which is now the uh, the corporation that I'm in, the Nanaimo Economic Development Corporation. Uh, as we are right now, uh, we include both uh, an economic development division, which I'm in, as well as a tourism services division, uh, or tourism Nanaimo. And we serve the area of Cassidy, which is essentially the Nanaimo Airport, uh, up to and including Lanceville, including Cabriola Island. So, uh, Right now, in 2013, we're, we have a, a BRNE program, but what I'd like to talk about today specifically is our 2012 uh, BRNE program. It was a very exciting uh, program, uh, and I, I really liked it a lot, so I want to tell you all about it. It was focus group based, uh, which is a little bit different than the norm, which uh, would be one-on-one -on -one interviews. Uh, forum participants uh, were grouped by industry sector, and discussions would vary based on the industry represented in that group. Uh, each forum was directed by a highly skilled facilitator. That was not me. We hired in a, uh, a facilitator who's absolutely fantastic uh, to guide the conversation and contribute to the discussion uh, when appropriate. So some of the short-term goals of the program were to identify businesses that were at risk of leaving the community, as all business retention and expansion programs do, uh, develop an understanding of their issues and concerns, and help them to resolve those issues uh, in order to keep them in the area. Uh, identify businesses that are considering expansion or have expansion potential and develop an understanding of their concerns and or barriers to work uh, proactively to help them to expand their operations here and create new jobs for Nanaimo residents. Uh, 
uh, to gather feedback about the Nanaimo business climate. Uh, this focus group uh, style of doing br and &E is actually an excellent way of, uh, of getting feedback about the, the business climate as a whole, uh, because as I'll discuss, uh, we get to touch on a, a number of different industry sectors, uh, which is a great uh, piece of this uh, type of process. And to facilitate business connections through greater knowledge of the Nanaimo business space. Uh, some of our long-term goals are to drive resources, organization, community, and partnership uh, to economic opportunities, uh, determine the needs of growth and value of uh, companies in the community, and watch for business and economic trends. So the way this process actually worked, uh, it would be a two-hour session with a, a group of business professionals, uh, usually between 10 and 15 business leaders from any given uh, industry sector. And during that session, a professional fil facilitator uh, gathers information on key issues from the participating company representatives. Uh, those company representatives, we'd like to be either company owners or senior management, uh, those folks who have a, a, their finger on the pulse of uh, business decision making and what impacts uh, that business in the community. Uh, confidentiality on, on business issues is preserved throughout the entire process. That's a key element uh, in uh, having these uh, uh, business leaders uh, convinced to actually participate in the program because they're in the company of their peers when we're having these discussions. So confidentiality is a, is a big deal. Uh, and information collected through the business forums is managed through a web-based database, uh, sorry, um, a web-based database system, BC Business Counts, uh, through the Executive Pulse uh, software. So these are the forums that we held uh, during 2012, construction, retail, tourism, green tech, uh, professional, scientific, and technical. Uh, in June, there was no session. Uh, and in July, uh, transportation, manufacturing, healthcare, uh, social agencies, large employers, and ending the year with arts and culture. Uh, they're all fascinating uh, discussions. And there were different things that were consistent throughout and different things that, uh, that we'd find different depending on the, the group we were speaking with. So these are some of the considerations that we, uh, that we thought about uh, throughout the process as well as at the beginning of the process before actually getting into this uh, focus group style br &E program. Uh, will participants be forthcoming in the company of their competitors? Now this is one of the things that when, you, when you're doing one-on-one -on -one br &E, uh, interviews, there's no real need to be concerned about this because it's just uh, you and the, uh, the business owner in front of you. But put in front of a group of 10 or 12 of their competitors uh, in the field, uh, that's certainly a consideration to be, to be taken. Uh, how are individual business needs addressed in a group setting? So when you're talking about general trends and general uh, challenges and opportunities facing an industry sector, uh, how are you talking to business A, B, or C about their particular uh, business interests? And finally, what is the appropriate balance of information gathering to problem solving? Uh, so I'll go through these uh, one by one, uh, being cognizant of the time. Uh, so will participants, uh, participants be forthcoming in the company of competitors? Uh, like Terry alluded to, businesses love to talk and they want to tell their story. And because we weren't gathering information about business secrets, um, or uh, trade secrets, companies were actually incredibly forthcoming about the different challenges they were facing and different opportunities that they saw uh, in their sector. So we had fantastic conversation uh, regarding uh, just those challenges and opportunities. And that comes with great help from a good facilitator. That's a really important piece of this, is finding a, a facilitator who knows how to move a discussion along, knows how to move from topic to topic. Uh, so that's very important. So we found that that was actually really encouraging. How are individual business needs addressed in a group setting? Uh, it's inevitable that in a discussion of uh, industry trends, uh, very often the stories will come down to individual business challenges, uh, at which point uh, you need to find a balance between talking about those uh, in the group setting and setting an appointment for later to discuss those. And the latter is often what we would do. We would say, uh, that's a very interesting issue. Uh, and we would schedule an appointment uh, to meet at a later time. Uh, it just got the conversation moving uh, so that we got our foot in the door. And finally, what is the appropriate balance of information gathering to problem solving? Uh, this process was very much an informa uh, information gathering process. 
Um, it was also, of course, very important to have a problem-solving aspect to it. But being that this was the first time we'd conducted this style of, uh, of session, uh, information gathering uh, was a big piece, and it was uh, actually a very successful piece. And I'll get into what we did with that information a little later. So some of the outcomes of this, uh, of this program was uh, dynamic conversation, um, one that I thought, in my experience, I haven't found in one-on-one -on -one interviews, uh, as interesting as they are, uh, being in a group of industry professionals that don't have the opportunity to meet uh, regularly, it's fascinating hearing uh, from a, a particular industry sector on what are the different challenges uh, that they're facing in the community. Uh, individual business problems are addressed, uh, as I uh, noted. Industry-wide challenges are discussed. <clears throat> Excuse me. Cross-industry ind issues are identified in a way that otherwise would be difficult to discover. So I had alluded to earlier that uh, in talking to all of these different industry sectors, we found uh, certain themes would run across all of the industry sectors, uh, regardless of which one you're talking to. And that was really interesting. Um, and in that respect, we got a lot of information that we would be able to pump out to the community at large, not focusing on an individual industry sector, that would really benefit all businesses. Um, and I'll get into that. It's actually really exciting that we're doing right now, um, right at the end. Uh, and economic development uh, is seen by the business community as proactive in supporting businesses in the multiple sectors. So that was important to us as well. Uh, we weren't singling out a uh, particular industry. Um, we were trying to be inclusive and to speak to our really our key industry sectors, uh, multiple industry sectors, and, uh, and that was received very well by the business community. So looking forward, uh, we're actually reinstating a similar focus group style program to be delivered in 2014. Uh, this year in 2013, we are doing the one-on-one -on -one business interviews. Um, in a little bit of a different fashion, we've uh, uh, coordinated with some of our uh, uh, community, uh, community partners, uh, including the Chamber of Commerce, uh, the Downtown Business Improv uh, Improvement Association, and others, uh, to administer the program, which has been very interesting and very good for our partnerships. Um, but like I said, next year we're going to be going back into a focus group style program. Uh, the cost and time effectiveness of this style of program administration benefits a team with limited resources for staff, uh, which we are. We are a team of, uh, I would say, two and a half on our economic development side. Uh, so going from, uh, door to, from business door to business door, conducting interviews, uh, takes a great deal of time, but inviting once a month uh, a group of 10 to 15 people to our office, to our boardroom, has proven fantastic uh, for time management and uh, getting everyone back to their day. Uh, and it also presents a fantastic marketing opportunity in that multiple key industries are being considered and not just one or two. Uh, so that's been um, really excellent. Um, and before I, I move on, I, I alluded to before that the information we gathered, uh, some of it uh, uh, pertains to all or if not most uh, industry sectors. So what we've done with that is actually created a, a seminar series this year uh, to address some of those challenges that were brought up over and over again uh, last year. Uh, so they've come into four categories, which are information gathering, uh, sales and marketing, there's uh, succession planning, and long-term strategic planning uh, for small business. And all four of those, we've, we've conducted three panel seminars this year, and there's one left to go, which is succession planning. Uh, so that's been a good way to uh, show that we're not just uh, gathering information for the sake of gathering information, but we're actually using it for to, to benefit uh, the business community at large. Um, and that's been very successful as well. And uh, that is my presentation. So thank you very much. we got a little bit of time. Um, okay. if, uh, oh, did I rip through that? <laughs> oh, no, that's fine, Peter. That was excellent. But, um, yeah, Darby's just mentioning um, that, that we've got a little bit of time, so if anyone has any questions that they'd like to pose at this point in the in the webinar, please go ahead and do so. Um, you can do it in the Q&A section um, online there. Yeah, so either the Q&A uh, at the top of your screen there, you can type in your question, or you can use that feedback indicator 
on the right hand side of the top of your screen there to, to raise your virtual hand and, and pose a question to uh, to any of our presenters today. And, and Peter, uh, no, certainly uh, it was a great presentation. Thanks for taking uh, um, yeah, time for, for this opportunity. Thank you. Time for uh, discussion after each one of the presentations as well. We'll uh, give a couple seconds more here to see if people aren't typing away and just trying to. Yeah, we do have a question. So we have a question here, and fortunately it's just slightly cut off my screen here a little bit. So, what was the feedback from the uh, participants? Uh, um, focus group participating. <laughs> or, let me just see here. If I can. Uh, I can see that one. Here we go. What was the feedback from the participants in the, the focus group? I should have been able to sort that one out. Uh, Peter, is that was does that look to be focused to you? Uh, sure, absolutely. Well, they, uh, and correct me if I'm. Not interpreting the question right, but the feedback within the each two-hour session, or the or the feedback about the process itself. Let me give uh, that person. I'm actually going to uh, just. Uh, I could answer both. I mean. That, sure. Why not? Let's do that. Sure. <laughs> just in case. <laughs> Excuse me. Just getting over a chest cold. I'll try not to get you all sick. Um, so the feedback within the session itself. Um, each two-hour session, like I said uh, uh, sort of early on in the presentation, that that was certainly a consideration of will participants be forthcoming or will we hear crickets um, because they're in the company of, of their competitors? Will they just sit silently and hope to learn trade secrets? Uh, what we found was actually just the opposite, and uh, the, the feedback within the sessions uh, was incredible. We, uh, our participants were incredibly forthcoming uh, about different challenges that they were having. And we found it was actually um, even more so in the company of their peers in that they were, they seemed to be having the discussion w with themselves. They were almost excited by the fact that they were in a room with other people who were sharing the same uh, experiences because often um, these businesses are essentially islands in the ocean and they, they don't get this kind of dy dynamic conversation very often. Uh, so that sparked some really great conversation uh, that lent itself really well to our information gathering uh, purpose. Uh, as for the feedback about the process itself, uh, it was incredibly well received, um, because uh, mostly because we were listening. Uh, that was a big uh, aspect, and I think it's it, it's a big aspect, regardless of how you're executing your BRNE efforts. It's the fact that you're seen to be listening uh, to your community. Uh, that's a big step just on its own. Um, is that you're listening and you care and you're part of the community and you want to help. Um, and this program definitely showed that. Uh, it definitely showed that we wanted to hear from our businesses and we weren't going to uh, shape our, our policy or our programming uh, before we had a chance to sit down and have a good discussion with groups of our, of our industry leaders. I hope that answers it. Peter, we, we should uh, we should move on to to Colin at this point too. We do have a couple more questions, and we thank our attendees for those questions. We'll we'll definitely have you at the top of the queue um, for our discussion um, following Colin. So thanks again, Peter and Amy. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Darby. Um, so let's move on to Colin's presentation. Colin O'Leary from Kamloops. Um, so with a robust foundation in science and technology, coupled with an MBA from the Sauter School of Business, Colin brings an eclectic mixture of business acumen and experience to his position at Venture Kamloops. Having been a part of many successful business startups and working with numerous new business ventures, Colin can bring first-hand understanding to the table for clients looking to embark in the excitement of their own business startup. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Colin. That's great. Thanks. Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, before we get into it too much, I should warn everybody, I was actually uh, just over at an EDAC conference in St. John's, Newfoundland. I flew in late last night, so I'm, uh, I'm probably not firing on all cylinders. You'll just have to bear with me for the, uh, for the presentation. 
But uh, I'm going to talk to you today about the BK Venture Advisor Program. <clears throat> and uh, this is kind of an interesting program in that uh, we are also doing uh, BRE uh, Business Retention and Expansion Survey ourselves. There's huge value in that. It's an excellent program. But we are finding that the, our BRNE survey was typically dealing with um, like medium to large size businesses. And so the idea behind the BK Venture Advisors was to come up with a program that actually targeted and focused uh, entre with entrepreneurs and new businesses that were starting up. So with that, I'll get into it here. So the mandate of the program is to help uh, develop and support local entrepreneurs to achieve success by providing constructive feedback, professional advice, and networking opportunities. So uh, the VK Venture Advisor. So in essence, really what it is, I uh, was not reinventing the wheel. Uh, uh, one way that I often uh, describe it to people and what people can easily relate to is it's much like the Dragon's Den, which is something that I find uh, naturally uh, captures entrepreneurs anyways, really captures their interest. captures a lot of people's interest, actually, because uh, it's something they can relate to and they really enjoy. And, and that's, in essence, what this is, except for uh, the difference is that they're getting up, uh, these entrepreneurs. There's one entrepreneur is selected uh, every month uh, with an opportunity to basically pitch their business idea and get professional, constructive feedback on it. Uh, but there's no funding provided whatsoever. It's, uh, there's no, this is not a financing uh, program. It's, instead, it is purely raw feedback. Uh, constructive feedback from very successful people who have been there before them, and also uh, the, the connections. And connections, I found, actually have been one of the biggest things that have come out of these meetings that have been uh, very exciting. So the day of the presentation, what does it actually typically look like? Uh, so it's held over at the KPMG office, a very nice office. Uh, we provide lunch. And it happens over lunchtime because we find that that's actually a very good time for a lot of these professionals. And the entrepreneurs arrive a little bit early and get set up for the, for the presentation. And then the idea is that the presentation is made to a panel of professionals and experts for around 20 minutes or so. And typically what we find um, is that it, this way it's supposed to run, but it actually usually doesn't. The idea is the presentation happens first, and then the next 40 minutes is open to discussion. Uh, but what we actually find is it's very dynamic. And so very rarely will an entrepreneur make all the way through their presentation before there starts to be feedback coming from uh, all directions and questions. And so um, the panel themselves, who they are, is they are basically what we would call pillars of influence in the community. So these are professionals and business leaders that are very well known, very well connected in the community, they're usually on all sorts of boards, uh, you know, constantly volunteering for different events and things like that. So people know them. And they're also very well respected and, uh, and well, like I said, very well connected as well. And so it's, it's a unique experience to be able to tap into this panel. Typically during a meeting, we'd have uh, anywhere between 8 and 12 of them actually sitting around a U-shaped uh, table in front of the entrepreneurs. So let's go to the next slide here. So what's expected of the entrepreneur? <clears throat> so the first thing is the entrepreneur has to prepare a presentation. This is actually something that uh, I will work with the entrepreneur on. We will actually spend uh, uh, easily about eight hours before the presentation is working on it together. Uh, part of the reason behind this is that we don't want to, I don't want to waste the professional, uh, the, the advisor's time, really. I don't want to waste anybody's time, so I want to make sure everybody's as prepared as possible so everybody gets the absolute most out of the experience. The idea then is the, the entrepreneur comes in and they're supposed to dress professionally or wear, uh, wear their uniform if they've got one. They're supposed to bring the product. We try to sample the product as much as possible. Uh, it really helps the advisors wrap their, wrap their minds around it. Uh, I also asked them for an executive summary of beforehand and a bio so they can actually circulate it to the advisor so they can start to think about things the week before. Um, and I asked them to actually look at the bios for the, the VK Venture Advisor advisors. And that way they can actually target their questions. Uh, so like we have like an accountant, we have a lawyer, we have a, you know, insurance professional, a finance professional, a real estate professional. Uh, so we kind of try to cover the gamut of everything, HR, marketing, and uh, the idea is that uh, this is a chance for them. They don't have to have all the answers. This is their chance 
to actually ask questions and say, well, I don't really know where to go with this. Like, this is where I am right now. I'm thinking about doing this, but I don't know. What do you guys think? And they can actually uh, get professional feedback for free. And it's better than just a one-on-one -on -one kind of interaction because the advisors interact with each other. It's, quite, it's actually quite exciting to uh, witness because they'll, you know, it's a very lively discussion. They will actually disagree with one another, uh, talk about experiences they've gone through in their career, during their career. So uh, it's 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 quite uh, it's quite good actually. The um, uh, the as far as what's expected of the advisors, so I ask that they review the business plan obviously before the meeting. Uh, they, I also ask that they give professional feedback that's constructive in, in a respectful manner. Unlike the Dragons Den, we're not going after drama. We, uh, we, we are, I try to keep it as constructive as possible. Uh, the idea is not to get up there and tear somebody's ideas to shreds. It's instead to get up there and, and still asking the tough questions, though. Uh, because it's the reality of when these entrepreneurs go out there to start their business, they're going to come up against these challenges and they better have answers. And that's the idea is to prepare them before they really get going. Uh, the biggest thing here, this next point, strive to make beneficial network connections. This is absolutely the, um, the, the hidden kind of bonus of all this. When we started doing this, I didn't really anticipate these network connections playing such a major part in things, but uh, they've actually, that's really probably the best takeaway from all of this. And the idea is they're also supposed to provide a free follow-up uh, appointment, professional appointment uh, to the entrepreneur. So the entrepreneur can now access for free after this on one-on-one, -on -one, an hour with the accountant, an hour with the realtor, an hour with the lawyer, which is great for them because they often have quite a tight budget. Uh, so some of the outcomes, um, very, very positive feedback from the entrepreneurs. Not, uh, that's not very surprising, but... Very positive uh, feedback from the advisors, which is something I did not anticipate because this is a volunteer thing. And they really see it uh, as an excellent ability to, uh, or a way to give back to the community. Uh, and so this is something I didn't anticipate, and it's actually been nice to have this from both sides. Uh, very constructive information and connections. The connections are absolutely unbelievable that have come out of this. Uh, for example, the... Um, the, one of my very first entrepreneurs was a uh, Red Seal chef, and he was he lived in Jamaica for a while, and he was supplying cheesecakes to five-star restaurants. He's coming back to Kamloops, where he's born and raised, and he wants to start up his uh, cheesecake business in Kamloops. And um, he kind of didn't really know where to go. We, we got out of this meeting. He got a mentor with a fellow named Bryce Herman, who is extremely well-connected in the community and with hospitality. Bryce managed to hook him up with a uh, commercial location uh, for 50 cents on the dollar, all of the equipment already included, uh, and it was a lease-to-own arrangement because Bryce knew the owners. And so, I mean, that is something, uh, I remember the entrepreneur just coming out of that and saying, I would have never found that on my own. Like, this is unbelievable. That's an example. I mean, just last, our last presentation we had was with uh, Odily Awesome, who are a really unique kind of food manufacturing company in town. And we were able to, through again, through some of these connections, we were able to link them directly to somebody very high up in the Patterson group, uh, Dennis, who was able to uh, get them in front of the right people to have their products carried in Save On Foods, Cooper's, Overweighty, that whole Patterson food group. Uh, which is, again, something where the entrepreneur was just like, this is unbelievable. I, I didn't really even know how to get into a, a grocery store, let alone uh, access to uh, multiple chains right across, uh, I think, Western Canada. So that was pretty amazing. So that gives you an idea of some of the connections that come out of it. Uh, the other thing is we get increased community awareness for venture cameras. This is something that uh, I think a lot of us struggle with. But... Uh, I don't know about you guys, but we get a lot of well, what's economic development and, you know, what do you guys do for the community? This is something that is, it's kind of a sexy program. It's actually over the kind of way I would market it, but it gets really, it gets people excited and interested. And uh, something that's kind of unique is I'm actually getting now professionals in the community approaching us and saying, by the way, I'd like to participate as an advisor for this VK Venture Advisor Program. I'm hearing about it in the community. It sounds really exciting. And I'm now getting entrepreneurs uh, on a regular basis coming in and hearing about this program 
which is great because it's driving clients through the door in essence because uh, a lot of these advisors are the owners or CEOs of companies in town. And not only that, then we also have the entrepreneurs coming in. So some pretty great outcomes. And, uh, yeah, I think I'm, I'm, I've finished a little early, but that's, that's a logo. We, we came up with a brand for it and everything. We have a website. And, and it's just kind of a, it's a different uh, program, uh, like I said, just specifically targeting uh, new venture creation, which is kind of a, a unique thing to, to go after. It's a lot of fun. So there, I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> I don't know, uh, Darcy, if you want to take it from or Darby, if you want to take it from here, or thanks, thanks, Colin. That was that was great. Um, yeah, absolutely. So now we can um, shift over to our uh, discussion portion of uh, today's webinar, and there were a couple of questions um, that weren't addressed when we had last had that short period after Peter's. So, but uh, in the interim, while we while we speak to those, I'd certainly encourage uh, uh, the rest of you, and I'll just uh, steal the camera away from you there, Colin, back to back to us. Um, so, yeah, I certainly encourage the rest of you to, to please uh, put in any questions you have in the in the Q and A there, or uh, we'd love to talk to you too. So, if you use that uh, feedback uh, button again on the top right hand corner, you can uh, raise your virtual hand there, and uh, again, we'd like to speak to you for sure. So. Um, as those come up, I'm just going to drag this out so we can see it here. And uh, Peter, we, we did have a question. It was, I think, kind of following up to uh, the question you were speaking to before. And uh, the question is, uh, do you anticipate doing this every year? Um, I'll bring the, the video back to you. Can, you. can you speak to that? Sure, absolutely. Uh, we're dedicated to doing some sort of br &E effort each year. Uh, I personally am a huge fan of this style. Uh, just after having done it the one time, it was a bit, it was a bit of a pilot uh, in the way that we were doing that focus group style session. Uh, but it was, it was just so great. <laughs> and I would be very happy to do that every year. And I know that we're, uh, like I said, we're reinstating that style of program in 2014 um, with a little more focus on problem solving. Uh, we've already done uh, the program so we're really focused on information gathering and also problem solving. Um, but this one, uh, it's sort of, we've gone through the process of information gathering about challenges and opportunities. Now we're really going to get to the heart of the matter and uh, really address individual business issues to see uh, how we can do that. Uh, we're still structuring that program right now, uh, but I would love to see uh, an iteration of that style of program every year. I think it's really effective. We are getting questions uh, queuing up here. So, Peter, another question for you. I hope this did follow uh, your <laughs> your, your uh, um, presentation there, but uh, mm -hmm. the question if you're not able to see it and, and others won't be, so I'm going to read it out. So, question for Peter. Do you think businesses were more comfortable with a third-party facilitator as they were, and in quotations, outsider, um, mm -hmm. they were an outsider, who had no opinion or bias? And uh, a continued question, do you think uh, the convo would be as dynamic if the facilitator was someone from the ECDEV department? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, maybe. Uh, the only uh, thing that I would say maybe not would be at each of these two-hour sessions, uh, members of the economic development team were present. Uh, that was a, a sort of a big piece of it. Uh, just to uh, really to tie us to the program to make sure everyone knows that it's the economic development office that's doing this. Um, and we uh, maybe I'm biased, but I, I don't think uh, we, we saw any hindering of the process by our being there, uh, which makes me think that if if there was a member of your economic development team that was a professional facilitator that was very knowledgeable about different uh, uh, business sectors, that I don't think that would really be a problem. The the important piece is that the facilitator is capable. That's the, that's the big one for me, is that they're very good at moving a conversation along. Uh, like I said, we were worried about hearing crickets, and I really feel like if, uh, if we didn't have a professional facilitator, we may actually have heard crickets. Uh, so I really attribute a lot of our success to the fact that we've brought in uh, someone who does this for a living. Uh, so that was important. Uh, being an outsider, um, I'm not sure. Uh, maybe, <laughs> depending on the group. Peter, and um, 
Now if I could ask all the attendees to actually help us um, by uh, actually ensuring that your line is muted, and that's a star six, because what I'm going to do is open up the lines here, and uh, um, Emily, you've uh, raised your virtual hand, so uh, I'd ask you actually not to mute your line, I might do the opposite with uh, star six here in a second. So um, I am going to take things out of lecture mode, and, and hopefully the audio will be good enough that we can uh, start a, a discussion here. So just a moment, please. The conference is no longer in lecture mode. So far, it sounds pretty good. Um, Emily, are, are you there, unmuted? And, uh, did you sure, yes, I'm here. Please, go ahead. Okay. Um, I guess my question, I understand that the R&E programs are meant to be preventative and help you to, to engage with businesses throughout their, their business life, but what happens if you encounter a business where they're already feeling very... Um, very frustrated or very tangled in, in their operations, and how do you help them to untangle that knot? Very good question there. Do, do any of our presenters uh, want to tackle that question? Uh, I'll try that one. Peter? If no one else will, sure. <laughs> Uh, so I think it would I think it would depend on what the uh, the business issues were. Uh, a big uh, part of what makes I think economic development so successful is our ability to link to uh, resources in the community. So if it's a uh, expansion real estate uh, issue, we can link to our our real estate partners. Uh, if it's something in financing, then we can go that route as well. Um, so. I wonder if, uh, depending on the business issues that they're having, if they're already frustrated, uh, then it might be a different process than, uh, like I said, for the information gathering side, because that's already been done for you. They're giving you all that information, uh, and then it's right into uh, sort of uh, business as usual, which is problem solving and uh, getting them the right uh, resources uh, to get them on track. Um, I wonder if that's uh, sort of an answer. That's helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Did, did any other of our other presenters um, want to speak to that? And if uh, if not, we do have some other questions here, so let's just cut in now if, if so. Otherwise, um, there is a question here for uh, Terry, it looks like. So, um, and here it is. So, back to Terry uh, McDonald's presentation. She mentioned those communities that don't have uh, dev capacity have some challenges getting back to you. I may have missed this, but could you um, expound on how that is uh, being gotten around, plans, ideas, on how to address the capacity challenges of these very small communities, rural area, areas? Terry, um, uh, are you can you speak to that? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Debbie, for the question, because that is our that is our big challenge here in the Kootenays with, as I mentioned, a number of these communities having what I'm referring to as limited economic development capacity. And, in fact, I had an email from one of our partners uh, this morning about just feeling a little bit of anxiety about releasing their business retention and expansion findings and, and feeling a little bit out of the loop with respect to what supports are out there. So. What we're looking to tackle from a regional level and, and through the advisory group um, that actually got together last week, we're speaking of this very thing. And what we've learned so far is that we do have a number of supports, business supports, that operate on a regional or a sub-regional level. So the example being uh, the community futures groups, um, the innovation councils, the colleges, and we also have something unique here in the Kootenays. It's the Business Basin Advisors Program, and that's something that's offered through the Columbia Basin Trust. So what we've realized uh, pretty quickly with these smaller communities is they themselves don't even know what supports are out there, nor do their businesses. So uh, a couple of things that we are moving forward with to tackle this very thing is um, one of the communities that has just finished, when they release their business retention and expansion findings to the community, which is going to be happening within the next month or so, They'll be doing it in conjunction with a business support fair where they'll be inviting some of these folks to come in and speak to the businesses about what supports are out there. The other piece is really plugging this information back into community partners in the smaller communities so that they have a list and an overview of who they can refer to. So it's not that they're not um, 
willing and able to refer. It's just they don't know who to refer these businesses to. So it's an information an information gap. I think is a big piece. Um, the other, I guess, strategy is to formalize a bit more of a regional uh, support network so that people can really feel free to pick up a phone and if they don't know who to refer to, uh, they can start asking around and getting those referrals in place. And then I guess the other the other piece, uh, this being a pilot project, and of course myself being a researcher and this being an applied research project, really paying close attention to what gaps are existing within our region. So. Um, what challenges are these smaller communities facing and where, what are the gaps in our region with respect to the supports uh, that are being asked for through this business retention and expansion project? I hope that, I hope that answers your question. I'm, I mean, we really are figuring it out as we go, uh, but the, the information gap was a really, it was a low-hanging fruit piece for us that communities just didn't know all the great supports that we do have. So we'll start there. Thanks, Terry. Thank you. Another question here um, from Mark. I'm sure that's Mark Imus. Um, so, question for Colin. For the uh, VQ advisor, Colin, how often are presentations made to the panel of advisors? Colin? Right. So, uh, we, we typically we aim at one a month, one per month, and the idea behind that uh, right now is that it is, it is a time commitment from the advisors. So we are volunteering, so we don't want to take up too much of their time. Uh, but also right now, probably our biggest bottleneck with it is actually finding uh, new businesses that are all really ready to go. And, and that's, uh, I, I mean, like I see a lot of entrepreneurs, I'm sure, you know, during my peak, I'm sure I'm seeing at least 100 a quarter. Uh, but the problem is there's a, there's a big difference between an entrepreneur who just walks through the door with an idea on a napkin and an entrepreneur that has a fully fleshed out business plan, has already like registered a trademark for their name and blah, 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 and, has, and or has a prototype uh, or has lined up sales. And that's kind of more the entrepreneur I'm looking for with this just so that we – because I don't want all this energy and effort to go into an entrepreneur that walks away and just never starts the business. And so that's why it's limited to once a month. But we might start to ramp that up to twice a month if we can if we can start to feed in uh, more entrepreneurs that are that are really ready. So yeah. Thanks for your question, Mark. And um, again, we're open here for for discussion here. Well, and we might be having just a little bit of feedback there, so if, uh, if you haven't, if, if you don't mind uh, uh, muting your line, and unless there was a question there, and, and please do pose it if that's the case. Does anyone have a question there? So again, you can raise your virtual hand or, uh, or type it in through the, the Q&A there at the top. Um, also on the screen in front of you, we do have... Uh, few questions there that uh, we'd certainly like to hear back um, from you about, um, if, if any of you uh, can speak to any of these. So what challenges and or opportunities had your community experienced with BRE initiatives? Any comments or questions um, in regard to that? Don't be shy. And likewise, with, uh, with any of these questions, I doubt you can um, read them in front of you, but if, if any of you are just listening in um, as well, do you have any success stories or lessons learned you would like to share? And, uh, and as well, what tools or resources would better support uh, business retention and expansion in your community? Is there any comments, questions there, or otherwise, please, now's your chance. Give it another uh, 30 seconds or so here. We do have some
some re resources that we've highlighted here. Um, so here's the Business Traction Toolkit, the uh, EME and CAP two off the top, as well as the Business Retention and Expansion Link and Business Logs Program. So all of those were, were, were spoken to there. Um, and our uh, presenters today have kindly made themselves uh, available to you. Uh, if you do have uh, additional questions, um, um, here is their um, their contact information, and it looks like we do actually have a, another question. So, Carolyn, you've raised your virtual hand. If you if you do get star six, uh, please go ahead and pose your question. Hi, this is for um, sorry I forget your name, but for Venture Camloops. Colin. 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 There we go. Sorry, Colin. How did you know, or how confident were you that you'd have enough of these entrepreneurs to make a go of the program? Did you that's do any tough. initial? Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. No, that's that's totally a tough question. Uh, the and it was uh, it was quite hard, kind of making that decision. But I had, um, like I said, I don't know about your community, but in particular during the first quarter of the year, I see a lot of entrepreneurs. Like I, I actually joke, it's kind of like trying to drink out of a fire hose. So we actually try to like uh, find ways of like slowing down the inflow and making sure we're only capturing people with really strong ideas. And so uh, I was lucky uh, enough. I can't take 100% full credit actually for the program because a long time ago in Kamloops, there was something called business care that was existing in Kamloops, and it was similar. It was along the same lines, and um, it had just kind of faded out into nothing. So really, I kind of uh, I I resuscitated the program and rebranded it, and, and actually have changed it quite a bit. But I mean, the essence it was there. And the biggest thing is that I had the um, I had the contact information from the people that were the advisors before. So because that's the other half of the story is actually lining up the advisors and getting them on board. And so. I started contacting them and said, do you have any interest in trying to get something like this going again? Like, would you participate if we did it? And uh, had basically overwhelming feedback from them that absolutely we loved it. And this is, uh, we were very sad to see it go. We'd really like to participate. And so having that support from that side and knowing that I would see a lot of entrepreneurs, I, uh, I basically decided, okay, let's just give it a shot. Let's give it a go. And if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. I also, I mean, I did other things to mitigate this, like, for example, I partner with our university, TRU, and I actually talk about this program in the two streams of entrepreneurship. One of them is tourism management entrepreneurship, and the other one is just new venture creation in business. And so I go in and talk to the classes, and I participate in other kind of class events and things, and that kind of helps to, to feed me kind of a steady supply of entrepreneurs besides what I get normally in the community. So... I don't know if that answered the question or not. But. Yeah, definitely. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. I do have another question for either Terry or Peter, if there aren't any other questions from any other people out there. Terry, uh, do you wish to speak to is it the same question? or? No, no, a different question. A different question? I'm, I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> okay. So this will be for either Terry or Peter. But how how did you ensure that any of the home based businesses were um, reached in your efforts, or were they, or were they not? Maybe. Well, that's that's a good question. That's actually come up. Um, one of the areas that's undertaking the brie right now is in the Spokane Valley, um, where the majority of businesses are actually home based businesses. So. Um, it, it really was uh, sort of get the key partners sitting down at a table and talking about all the businesses that they knew. Uh, the other strategy, and it was used by the innovation councils as well, was to, when they did a business interview uh, with a company, they asked that company if they knew of others. So it's sort of called, it's sort of the, the snowball technique to try to, to try to uncover some of these home-based businesses, particularly in the communities that have a high percentage that are very interested in what's happening with the home-based business. The other piece um, that we did uh, and, and piloted with the Spokane Valley was we created a, a shorter survey. So we took the BC Business Count survey and we cut it from, I don't know, 90, I think they have 97 or so questions, and we cut it down to 30 questions. 
and selected the questions that were most applicable to uh, home-based business. So customizing the survey was also um, a real key piece. Um, these businesses really don't want to sit down for an hour and a half interview being asked questions that don't relate to them in any way. So, so yeah, I guess the, the two things would be the, the short survey and then the, um, you know, tapping into local knowledge about where these home-based businesses are and then using what I call the snowball technique to start uncovering um, those that we've missed in the first sort of list of, of businesses to contact. Does that help? Yeah, you Thanks. Great. Thanks, Terry. And, and Peter, did you also want to um, speak to that? Uh, sure. Yeah, um, that, that was great answer, Terry. <laughs> I'll follow it up with a, a, a less great answer. Uh, we, our uh, the way we've uh, sort of recruited uh, folks to our uh, to participate in our program was. Uh, based on NAICS codes and uh, our business license holders with the city. Um, so if there were uh, businesses without a business license, they wouldn't even be on our list uh, for consideration. And many of the sectors, uh, a home-based business wasn't as um, applicable, but for some they were, such as uh, healthcare. Uh, if we had a senior care uh, company that was working at home, uh, they would be in the group. So uh, they were represented certainly, um, uh, although we didn't have a group particularly for uh, home-based businesses, uh, it would just uh, vary depending on the group and depending on how their company fit into uh, the context of uh, their sector and the context of the group that they were speaking to. Uh, but we didn't particularly reach out uh, for home-based home -based businesses. Uh, we sort of came up upon them a little more organically. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it looks like we are getting close to um, needing to wrap up here. Um, so perhaps uh, I say thank you to each um, of our presenters today. Thanks very much for some very engaging and informative uh, presentations. I'd like to point uh, the attendees back to the, the handout section. Again, those materials won't be uh, available in depth for you. So uh, um, I know Terry would be some of the materials that she has up there, um, as well as a PDF of uh, today's slides. So I'd encourage you to download those now. Um, also, I'd like to emphasize again that we will be putting out a survey uh, following uh, in a couple of a couple of days here. So please keep an eye out for that, and please we, we benefit greatly from the information provided. So please provide that. Uh, otherwise. Thanks very much, everyone. Thanks, all. Thank you.